Tax deferral is so ingrained in the modern investment system that most people take it for granted. Their 401k at work gives them an immediate tax advantage, which is tough to pass up. Not only does it delay an unpleasant experience, paying taxes, but it's so easy in the modern system to tax defer that it's usually the default choice. Pair all of that with some common misconceptions around how it works, and it can be a recipe for failure, especially for high earners, super savers, and anyone trying to build generational wealth. In this video, we're going to cover many of those common misconceptions, talk about the biggest mistakes I see repeated around tax deferral, and end with some of the best overlooked strategies. But first, let's talk about the basics of how tax deferral works. Whether it's a 401k or an IRA, the concept is the same. If I save $5,000 into a tax deferred retirement account, my taxable income is $5,000 less this year, which at 20% taxes means I pay $1,000 less in taxes. I either don't pay the taxes in the first place or get them back when I file in the spring. Either way, I end up with $1,000 more to spend this year. Then my $5,000 grows until retirement. Let's say it doubles twice over 20 years and it becomes $20,000. When I take that money out, it's taxable. If it's still 20% taxes, I end up paying $4,000 in taxes, but get $16,000 to spend. For my $5,000 investment, I get $1,000 today in tax benefits and $16,000 in the future. You might immediately jump to the fact that we paid four times as much in taxes, but that's actually not the problem, and it'll lead us to our first few misconceptions about tax deferral. The first misconception about tax deferral is that because you're deferring taxes, you're going to somehow pay less taxes in the long run. Now, we're going to specifically talk about staying within the same tax bracket. Don't worry, we're going to get to different tax brackets soon. But in this graph, you can see that we start the investment at about $5,000. Over 20 years, it grows to about $20,000. We pay 20% taxes, and it drops down to being worth about $16,000. We see what would have happened if we had not put it into an IRA and instead put it into a Roth IRA, which still has tax-deferred growth, but you pay the taxes up front. So your $5,000 would have only been worth $4,000 because you would have had to pay $1,000 of it as taxes. You invest that $4,000, it grows at the same investment rate over those 20 years, and at the end, it's actually worth the exact same amount as that IRA would have been if you had paid taxes at the end. So if you stay in the same tax bracket, it really doesn't matter whether you pay the taxes in the beginning or the end. You largely end up with the same amount of money at the end. This is actually a really good time to talk about another misconception, which is that tax-deferred accounts grow better than non-tax deferred or non-retirement accounts because you don't have to pay taxes as it's growing. While all of that is true, it typically doesn't actually affect many investors because very few people pay the taxes out of the investment account. Yes, IRAs and Roths grow and you don't pay taxes on it while it's growing, but a non-retirement account with, that you're going to pay interest, dividends, and a little bit of capital gains, depending on how it's invested, those taxes are never or rarely paid from the actual investment account, They're typically just paid out of your checking or savings account. So in practice, an IRA, a Roth, and a non-retirement account that are invested identically typically grow at a virtually identical rate because the taxes are not paid from the investment account. Before we move on to the next misconception, it's really important to understand that this video talks about general concepts and taxes, and that your specific situation can be extremely nuanced. And although I do lots of tax planning with clients, it almost always involves their CPA. CPAs are who really understand the tax code and can make sure that your exact situation fits the plan that you're going to pursue. So if you are considering any type of advanced strategy, you really need to involve a CPA, and that this video is very much for general educational purposes only. The next two misconceptions come from the same narrative. The story that while I'm working, I'm in a higher tax bracket, and thus I should save into something tax deferred so that when I'm in retirement and take it out, I will pay less taxes then. Although that story 
can be true, let's take a look at the actual tax tables and see really where the rubber meets the road. Here they are for both single and joint. You can see that the two biggest jumps in the tax table are when we go from the 12% bracket to the 22, and then when we go from the 24% bracket to the 32. Yes, there is a little change here from 22 to 24, but all things considered, the bigger jumps are 10% and 8%. Now, in the joint table, it starts at 90,000 when it moves to 22, and then it doesn't go to 32 until 360,000. And I find in practice that most Americans typically fall somewhere in this range if they're worried about investments. You could imagine a couple that had a taxable earning of 250, maybe 300,000 at the highest point in their earning careers. And then when they go to retire, they might be planning on living on 100, maybe 120,000 in taxable income. You see that in this, they really don't move that much. Yes, they may have gone from the 24% bracket to the 22%. But is that 2% tax saving really worth everything else we're going to talk about in this video? Now, these are only the federal tax tables. There are state tax tables and all sorts of other important breakpoints, which is why working with a CPA is so important. The second problem with this narrative is that very often people in retirement find out that they are earning being taxed just as much as when they were working. I hear over and over from clients, I thought I was going to be paying less taxes in retirement. And for a lot of people, especially ones that worry about tax deferral and their investments, it's simply not true. They may have a pension, their own sizable IRA, they might inherit a sizable IRA, they might continue to work in some job or do contract work, they could have family income. There's all sorts of things that tend to add up in retirement that keep people in a similar tax bracket. So it's not just that the tax deferral doesn't commonly move people within the tax bracket while they're working. Most people find that they stay usually in the 22, 24% tax bracket even when they retire. Most of the mistakes I see can be explained with this graph. So what are you looking at? This is a graph of the income of a fictitious couple. The red line is their earnings, about 200,000 at 55. They're going to retire in about 10 years with their income slowly going up from pay raises. After they retire, their earnings drop to social security, but may also include a pension, an inherited IRA, residuals from business or part-time work. Then at 75, their RMDs turn off. It's 73 currently, but that's changing in the future. RMDs are their required minimum distributions, which is the money they're required to take out of their IRAs and pay taxes on. To understand these numbers, let's look at what their IRAs did over this time. At 55, they had about 800000 in investments. Over the next 10 years, contributing 20,000 a year and growing to just 6%, it reached about 1.6 million. Then through the first 10 years of their retirement, despite withdrawals, it continued to grow to about 2.2 million. And at 75, their first RMD is about 4% or almost 90,000. Even then, despite increased RMDs, the account value often continues to grow. At a 4% withdrawal rate, market growth can easily outpace that. Even at 90, the RMD withdrawal rate is only about 8%. That's why their income continues to climb late in life. The blue line is their living expenses, $120,000 a year inflated over this long time period. This area here in the beginning is while they're working represents their aggressive 401k savings, building a cash reserves, possibly paying for college, and other expenses that they don't expect in retirement. This area is what their retirement income is short and what they'll withdraw from their retirement accounts from 65 until their required minimum distributions kick in. You can see it's really not that much. This final area is the amount of money that they'll need to withdraw from their IRAs that they don't need to cover their expenses. They may be thinking, don't worry, that's not going to happen to us because we're going to spend it all. Well, the simple truth is that couples that have spent their lives building wealth rarely change dramatically overnight when they show up to retirement and all of a sudden start spending it. The habits and norms that you've lived with through your life don't change much when you get into retirement. You will spend some of it, and I'll be the first one trying to convince you to do it. But very often, this is exactly what we see, where accounts continue to grow, couples continue to live making smart financial decisions. And although your graph will not look exactly like what we were looking at, it's probably going to be pretty close. Okay, back to common mistakes. The first few have to do with this part of the graph. 
This is the only section of the graph that has the possibility of being in a lower tax bracket. And despite people saving for 30 to 40 years, waiting for a lower tax bracket, they still try and avoid taking money out of their IRAs. They live off cash, withdraw from Roths, or do all sorts of crazy things just to avoid paying taxes. That false narrative about being in a lower tax bracket in retirement is only true during this time. You need to capitalize on it. Don't spend down cash or deplete Roth accounts. If you don't spend from your IRAs, then the looming problems of RMDs gets even worse. This can be exacerbated by people who delay their Social Security until 70. This trench gets even lower, and then they have an even higher earning around RMD time. All that patient's waiting can just end up getting eaten by taxes. The next group of mistakes all stems from the fact that if you only save into IRAs, you have no flexibility in retirement. Everything you've saved is taxable. So if you ever need a big chunk of money, you end up spiking your taxable income, which can trigger all sorts of bad breakpoints like Medicare means testing. These breakpoints can affect you for several years after. If instead you've split your investments between IRAs and Roths or taxable accounts, you can pull money from those accounts and not face this huge tax burden. The last mistake I see is not understanding when IRAs may be inherited. If your parents are 28 years ahead of you in the game of life, and the last one passes at 93, a common narrative these days, then you're going to inherit that money right here and be forced to take the entire thing out over the next 10 years. The million-dollar inherited IRA eats up the entire low-income phase of your life. No one complains about inheriting a million dollars, but in that case, the IRS is going to end up being the most appreciative. When we talk about generational wealth, the impacts of tax deferral can compound fast in a way that can often unravel much of the work the family has put in. If I've scared you away from tax deferral, that was not my intention. In fact, I could have done an entire video about all the horrors of not tax deferring anything. So what are the best strategies when it comes to tax deferral? My advice really comes down to three guiding principles. The first is that flexibility is king. You don't know what the future is going to bring, and most financial plans don't survive contact with the enemy. Instead of trying to carefully plan out the next 30 years of your tax life, focus on flexibility. Splitting investment between traditional IRAs, Roths, and even some taxable accounts will ensure that you can react efficiently to life's curveballs. The second is to reject the idea that there's some dramatic difference between paying taxes now versus later. I know it's painful to pay taxes. When it comes to IRAs, you can't avoid them. Unless you're going to give it away to charity, you or your beneficiaries are going to pay the taxes. It's just a matter of time. Deferring the taxes doesn't change the math that much. It just limits your options. The last principle is that when IRAs cross generations, they can have a compounding effect that can really hamper a family's carefully laid plans. When you start stacking IRAs on top of each other, the tax impacts can be dramatic. Try and create a plan where you limit the amount of tax-deferred money transferring between generations. There are so many great options for families working with generational wealth that I could fill a separate video, which I will have to because I need to wrap up this video. But stay tuned to the channel and consider subscribing for future content. Tax deferral is not the problem, but I think the modern investment system really has failed many Americans by implying that it's the only solution. Instead, Focus on flexibility. I hope this has been informative. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.